The views expressed on this broadcast of Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with Dr. Alan Berger do not necessarily reflect those of Take 12 Radio, KHLT Recovery Broadcasting, or our affiliates. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Alan Berger and the Monty Man. Well, greetings, recovery family. Those of you who are in recovery, those of you who are advocates of, and perhaps some of you who should be welcome to another fine episode of Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with our friend Dr. Alan Berger. And uh, this week, joining us as our special guest is uh, Rum Radio's Joseph G. And uh, Joseph has been on the show before, and we've been on his show. And I just want to say uh, from both Dr. Berger and I, welcome, Joseph. Yes. You th- are you there? Yes. Okay. Okay, we got you. I- and- can you hear us okay? Yes. Okay. Dr. Yeah, it sounds great. Sounds good. Dr. Berger, how are you, my friend? Well, I am fine, money, and uh, here's our second show of 2014 already. That, 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 amazing, that, huh? That's right. And you were a guest on Joseph's show here just uh, not too many days ago. That's right. And that's right. Uh, yeah. you were we talking. encourage all our listeners to tune in to Rum Radio and and to listen to Joseph, some great stuff is happening there. He's kind of one of our sister stations. Rumradio.net is the website, folks, and uh, he is live. Dot org. Uh, dot, dot org. Rumradio.org, I'm sorry. Uh, we make sure that they know that. Rumradio.org, live Saturdays. Is it Saturdays or Sundays? Sunday nights, the live. Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Central Time. And then they can yeah. they can listen to the archives, too, correct? Sure. Yeah, all that they're all there. Yeah, they're they're all there. A lot of great shows. So, uh, Joseph, it's glad to, it's good to have you on. It really is, and it's always a joy to talk to you, um, Doctor Berger. What are we going to be discussing this week? Well, you know, one of the things I wanted to have you on to discuss, Joseph, is just you know how you see this whole topic of emotional sobriety uh, being discussed in the program today. What it means to you and and just what your sense is of, of where the fellowship is at with this issue. So can you share with us your thoughts and your opinions about those things? Sure. Well, Bill W., in one of his addresses, said the emotional sobriety was the new frontier. If you go back to the big book, it, it, it says um, sobriety is not enough. I think a man in thinking who says sobriety is enough. So the next level is emotional sobriety. I tell my sponsees, if they really want to be a good AA sponsor, go to Al-Anon. That's where you're going to get more of the emotional uh, bulwark of dealing with people. Now, emotions can be neither good nor bad. They just are. They Actually, they're good. It's what colors are experienced. The alcoholic takes it to the extreme, and no matter what area I deal in, I deal in the extreme. So I'm an emotionally charged person. I have a, an egomaniac with a low self-esteem. Sure. Anger could be as heady as whiskey once you've gotten a taste for it. So, Joseph, let me ask you this. Do you, do you, find, do you find a lot of people... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm finding it difficult even even finding uh, large numbers of people even working the steps anymore, uh, let alone learning how to be, uh, uh, you know, emotionally sober. Do you, do you find that there, there's just a lot of folks that just don't even delve into this emotional sobriety thing? Or do you think people are latching onto it more? No, I would say it's probably less. Your first understanding, that's one of the reasons I put together Rum Radio, one of many reasons, was that the the meeting themselves have become the solution. If you look at the grapevine, I believe it's the December grapevine, it says, don't drink and go to meetings. 
a lot of folks on Facebook with long-term sobriety, it really, their hair's on the back of their neck went straight up. And I explained to them that the grapevine, which is our meeting in print, is not innovative. It's not a pioneer magazine. It reflects what's going on in the fellowship today. So a lot of folks are going to the meetings, and the meetings are becoming the focal point of recovery. And working the steps with a sponsor has taken a back seat. And the emotional sobriety really comes with that interaction with a sponsor. That's the beginning of it, mm. well, in my experience. What, what, what do you say to that, Dr. You've Berger? Done that, yeah, go ahead. Dr. Berger, what, what, what do you say to that? No, no, you know, it's interesting that the way that, that we've been talking about it on, on our show, Joseph, is that the steps, one way of looking at the steps is that they're really designed to establish emotional sobriety. Um, you know, when you look at the 12 and 12, which was written 17 years after the original big book was written, that this is a real collection of Bill's thoughts about how these steps apply to our emotional lives and how we deal with things. So it's just rich with all kinds of references that later on he put in that letter he wrote that was called Emotional Sobriety, The Next Frontier, that showed up in an AA grapevine in 1958. The letter he actually wrote in 56. And what, the 12 and 12 was written in 52, as I recall. So right. it's interesting that all of this stuff was kind of the spirit of the times. And, it, you, know, it, you know, like you said, I mean, it's just not about putting the plug in the jug. I mean, that's very important, and I don't ever want to understate the importance. If you're out there drinking and using, that first you've got to get a handle on that. You've got to be able to establish your abstinence. And, you know, I love how the first step does it. It's a paradoxical intervention, you know. We find power by admitting our powerlessness. I mean, it's it's amazing how powerful that is. <clears throat> but the rest of the program is about helping us grow up emotionally and spiritually. And uh, and that's what we've been talking about. And and I, I see, you know, I, I recently did a Google search on emotional sobriety, and I was so pleased to see how many different places, different parts of the country, that emotional sobriety is being talked about. They've got speakers speaking on the issue. They've got weekend retreats taking place. I mean, I really think our fellowship now is starting to grow up in one way, in that we're ready to start talking about some of these things and really facing our emotional immaturity. Yeah, that's good news. Yeah, the immaturity. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's what this is all about, and that's what we've been talking about on this show, is that this emotional sobriety thing first begins when we realize how emotionally immature and emotionally dependent we've been in our lives. And that's what we've been encouraging our listeners, listeners to do is to really take a look at that and get honest with themselves about it. And what I loved about that uh, Grapevine article that showed up is Bill's level of honesty about that was just, to me, inspiring. I mean, I really respected the degree to which he was authentic about it, transparent, and his humility. So, um, you know, it's it's such an important topic because it really is the next frontier. Yeah, right on, right on. So where are we going with this today? Well, what we want to talk about is, you know, what, what we told um, our listeners, Joseph, is that what we're going to start doing is um, a couple years ago, Hazleton published my second book, which I talked a little bit about on your, your show, about talking about right. things to do when booze and drugs are gone. And what we've been doing is, uh, up to this point, we've been talking about different ideas about emotional sobriety. Uh, we went over how the steps um, uh, relate to this issue of emotional sobriety. And now we're going through and giving people some specific ideas of what does it mean, but more important, how do you establish this emotional sobriety or how do you keep yourself centered and not letting people knock you off balance? And the way we talk about that in this show is that it's about holding on to yourself. And there's a lot of different ways of holding on to yourself, but one of the ways that we're going to talk about today is about stop allowing other people to edit your your reality. 
You see, when we become emotionally dependent, then what we do is we give power to another person to change how we feel about something or how we feel about ourselves and what we're doing. I'll give you a great example. Um, I'm working with this uh, woman um, who's, you know, really, really, I mean, she's celebrating five years, and it's just been amazing. She was struggling with alcohol and with uh, opiates when I started working with her five years ago. She works a really strong program, and but... You know, this was her, I think, second or third attempt at dealing with this. She's got adult children. And when she relapsed this last time before coming into treatment, she, uh, her family was pretty much had it with her. Her sons were just totally disappointed in with her, angry. Uh, they didn't understand, you know, what was going on because they never got any help, which is unfortunate. And her husband was uh, very, very, you know, upset, thinking about divorce. If this happens again, I'm done. So now here we are, five years down the road. She's made amends to everybody. She's worked the steps. She goes and she volunteers and she brings the, does a uh, step meeting in the women's recovery home here in the area and stuff like that. And and one of her sons, who's really uh, still probably her harshest critic, says to her, "You know, Mom, you've got five years, but I don't trust you. I don't really think you're working a program. I don't think you've really addressed this problem. I think you're just." you know, doing all this stuff to placate the family and that it's not real. Oh, jeez. Wow. Yeah, got right? issues. Yeah, no kidding, right? You, you see the anger. You know, sometimes we say the family members are sick, if not sicker, than the uh, alcoholic or the addict, right? Yeah. And, uh, oh, absolutely. And in this case, you know, her first response was she was devastated. I mean, she was so shaken and... And oh my God, you know he, I'm, he's never going to forgive me. And you know she took it very, very personally, and it really sent her spiraling down into a depression. And you know when I first saw her, it was very interesting. Almost every other word out of her mouth was "I'm sorry." I mean, she was apologizing mm-hmm. for the very air that she was breathing. This poor woman. And you know now she's starting to get a sense of herself and, and who she is. And as we sat there and started to go through, I said, well, look, you know, it's important if somebody gives us feedback, you know, we're encouraged to take a look to see if there's any truth in it. You know, do you see any truth in what your son is saying? And she really poked around. I says, well, you know, do you keep regular contact with your sponsor? Wow. Two or three times a week we go out to lunch and stuff. Do you stay in, uh, you know, on top? Are you sharing with your sponsor? Are you being transparent? Are you on top of the issues that are going on all the time? I go, you know, are you going to meetings, three or four meetings a week? Are you being of service? Yeah, I take this meeting to meeting. I've done a 12-step call here. Da, 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 da. I said, so, look, when you take an inventory of your program right now, it sounds like you feel really good about what you're doing. And she says, yeah, I feel great. And so then the question becomes, so what is happening that your son's opinion of what you're doing is more important than what you know you're doing. Mm. What did she say? Well, well, you know, one of the th- what she said was she stopped. I mean, just like, you know, she did the same thing. She goes, whoa, is that what I'm doing? I says, well, is that what you're doing? And she goes, yeah, I guess I am. I go, yeah, you are. <laughs> There's no guess to it on my side. I know you're doing that. You're making his opinion and his limited opinion of what you're doing or is his opinion that's based on limited information about what you do because he doesn't even ask her about her recovery. <laughs> hmm. You know, it's one of those things. It's like it's still the elephant in the living room. Is that she it? doesn't volunteer a lot with him either, and you can understand why. So, you know, what we got into is that what this goes back to is her wanting him to like her and forgive her. And that she's basing her feelings about herself on way based on, you know, what her son is feeling about her. And she's losing touch totally with how she's feeling about herself. She's making him and his thoughts and ideas about her more important than her own thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, look, obviously there's a part of her that's still upset about what happened and being an alcoholic and an addict and all of that other stuff. 
but there, there's still this other part of her that makes him way too important in what he's saying. Why do people... She gave him the power to edit her reality, and her reality was that she's working a solid program, and, and she really is. And once she got that perspective and understood that she was doing this, she was able to stop doing it and regain her balance. Because that's the thing that I see that's most important. And when it's happened to me, I mean, I, I can share a few stories about this myself. I mean, um, you know, how when you're put in a situation and all of a sudden somebody says something to you and, you know, you make that more important than what you know. Um, and we could share a few anecdotes. Maybe you guys have some in your life. But I know that in, as the longer I've been around, the more I'm able to keep a sense of myself and not let other people and their craziness determine how I feel about myself. Do, do you think that people act like her son acted because they're they're not okay with themselves based on her, you know, well, whether you she know, stays sober I or not? Say it, Monty, the way I think about it is he's never gotten any help with his feelings. Right, he's so he doesn't know. It's a family disease, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we, give, we pay lip service to this all the time. I mean, this is one of my, you know, real strong beefs with the treatment community is everybody talks about this being a family disease, and, and pretty much the treatment field gives lip service to helping the families. Sure. Bring them in for a week. They'll go through this family week, you know, a treatment, which is like five days. Yeah. There's very little interaction that takes place between the person, let's say the alcoholic and their family, and when they do interact, it's it's structured exercises, and it's it's pretty in my it's pitiful in my opinion that we're not doing more for the family. Now, contrast that with the incredible program, let's say that Jerry Mo has at the Betty Ford Center, where the children come in for a week. And these kids are really digging into what's going on with their family. And at the end of the week, they sit there and they read a letter to their alcoholic parent, you know, in terms of um, what the alcoholism or the drug addiction has done to them and how they feel about it. And it's, I mean, those are tear jerkers, man. I mean, those are so powerful. But very few programs are helping the families to that degree. Yeah, and you certainly don't hear about any follow-up afterward. You hear about follow-up with addicts and alcoholics. And, and, and many times, unless there's a MAPS program in place or something, there's not a lot of that either. But there certainly well, that's, isn't any that's with, right. with that's, the family. That's right on, Monty. Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing, right? We encourage, you know, families are encouraged to go to Al-Anon, right? And that's probably what they're even told in those things. But what do you think the compliance is? of people going to Al-Anon, it's probably very low. Sure. Because what what is it? The belief is we don't have the problem. Who has the problem? Yeah, they do. It's their problem. Yeah. 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 Another In this case, like the you truth. can see, and, and Mrs. Ford would talk about this a lot. I've heard her speak before how important it was that Gerald got some help. That at when he, because he would do a lot of things that would, you know, be challenging for her to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the more that he started to get some help, the better that, that it was between them so that they could start to have, you know, a partnership in recovery. Sure, you bet. Jo Joseph, do you, um, is that been your experience? That, do you see people that are family members and loved ones who just don't seem to be getting plugged in? Well, one point on, I, I love Betty Ford. She'd get drunk and Jerry would fall down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are we going to do well, with that's him? That's why we had you on tonight for that one-liner. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, couple points. One is uh, I call it codependicitis. You know how you, do you know how you know when you're codependent? How yeah. do you know when you're codependent? When you're dying, someone else's life flashes in front of your eyes. <laughs> Just <laughs> codependentitis. I like that. Um, I think what I see and I experience this myself. Uh, my children haven't forgiven me. I've asked for forgiveness. I've done what I could to try to mend the fence. Uh, evidently, what had happened was at the time 
Uh, it did happen when I was out and I wasn't available to them. Uh, they, it was at a very critical time in their development. And they just want to uh, hold on to it for whatever reason. They, they just can't let go. You know, Sorry to say, you well, know, because they have but a their feelings, right? I mean, that's no. the problem with this is that, you know, if someone doesn't get some help in, you know, the way the metaphor I use a lot of times is lancing the boil so that the pus can drain. If someone doesn't get some help in letting, in really experiencing the pain, the anger, whatever else they need to do so it can drain, then they, then there's never any room for forgiveness. Because you can't have forgiveness when there's still all that pain and hurt. That's got to be addressed first. Forgiveness is the result of a process. It can't start in the beginning. But you're right. See, most people don't see themselves as needing help in dealing with those feelings. They see themselves as a victim of somebody else's behavior, and it's the other person that's the problem, not them. Yeah. Yeah. So, Joseph... That's an unfortunate perspective, because... You know, it's funny because forgiveness, there was a great project done up in Stanford on this whole forgiveness thing, Joseph, that I just love this guy's work. His name is Dr. Fred Lushkin, or Lushkin. Is it Lushkin? I think it's Lushkin. And he did, wrote a, a book called Forgive for Good. And the, before they went into forgiveness and helping people with forgiveness, they tried to understand what creates a grievance or a resentment, right? Mm-hmm. How is it that people develop that? And he found three things. That first of all, that the person that has the grievance took what the other person did personally. So if we apply that, let's say, to your family, that obviously they took whatever you did with your drinking or using, and they took it personally. Like somehow, if you really cared about them, you wouldn't have done that. Now you, and I know, and you know too, Monty, that this is not about what we're doing to anybody else. It's just what we're doing. Right. Right, we're not right. doing this to people. It's just what we're doing. Now, the truth of it is, is if we could somehow make it more personal, maybe that would help. But it doesn't. This disease is hijacks the brain. That doesn't mean that we're not responsible. We are, but it's not personal. That, that, that's right. It's an, it's an insanity. It's it's not. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's yeah. not personal. We're not doing this because of how we feel towards someone, and that if we love them more, we wouldn't do it. That's not the issue. The second thing that he found, so first of all, people take it personal. The second thing is, is they blame the other person for the feelings they're having. Mm. That if you didn't do this, I wouldn't feel this way. Instead of saying, this is how I reacted to what you did. These are my feelings. I'm responsible to deal with them. Uh Uh-uh. They say, you made me feel this way. You're responsible, and I can never forgive you because of how you've made me feel. So when they get caught in the blame game, they totally disempower themselves to be able to deal with the feelings. And then the third thing, and this is where his research was brilliant, is that what they did, they do is they keep telling the story over and over again with themselves as a victim in it, and they keep injuring themselves and re-traumatizing themselves. Mm. So every time they tell the story about what the other person did that was wrong and that hurt them, they are now reliving that experience, and they are re-traumatizing themselves. I, I have a, um, I have a person that I know quite well. I'll just put it that way. That every time a group of us get together, she brings up how, uh, amongst all the uh, the members of her family, how she was the one that was always overlooked, and she brings it up every single time. And she's in her fifties, mm-hmm. you know, and, well, and, and it just, it, it, it doesn't, it kind of <laughs> sours the events, you know, <laughs> yeah. but let me ask Joseph this. Um, mm. and, and, and I, I know I've done this, but, but have, you know, have you in the past allowed other people to edit your reality? Mm, how far? I, I'll put it to you this way. Some people don't know me, and Mm. they don't like me. Right. Some people get to know me, then they don't like me. It's none of my business what you think of me, because you think so little of me anyway. It's not in stature, surely in time. But have you ever let that, have you ever let that screw with your reality, mess up your day, 
Um, oh, sure, yeah. sure. Well, it takes time. I mean, when yeah. I, you know, it takes time to mature. You know, I, when I'm younger, I, I look around and I'm concerned with other people think about me. So my reality is in theirs. I, I wanted to say about emotions. Emotions are holographic in nature, meaning that nothing externally can stimulate the exact same feelings that it had at a different time. You can get angry, nobody else is in the room, but just your thought process. You can dredge up an emotion, and it's so holographic that it's as real as it was when it first happened. Yeah, that's true. I've done that. You done that, Doctor Berger? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 definitely. And that's what Doctor Lushkin was saying, right? It is Lushkin, by the way, L U S K I N. That's what he was saying. Is that 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 when we recall it that way, that you just you feel it all over again. You experience it. Yeah, yeah, exactly the same. Well, that's yeah. Was it M P? Was it um, uh, rapid eye movement? They work on that. That's right. That's yeah, there. that's right. They try to help you establish some new pathways, right, new neural pathways, uh, supposedly with the interventions they have. Well, listen, buddy, why don't we take a break, and then when we come back, why don't we talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you get a hold of yourself and keep your shape, regardless of somebody else's opinion? I, I mean, I like what Joseph says, right? You know, that everybody thinks so little of us, but, you know, when this happens to us, we think that we're the center of the focus for them, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that we, we really make it a big deal for ourselves. So what can we do to I get ourselves right-sized and to keep this issue right-sized? All right, so when we come did back... You hear that, did you hear that they had just discovered that there's another whole universe? I was really excited when I heard that, and the first thing I did was I applied for the position of center. I, be- I don't know why, but I believe you. I believe you. Okay, folks, um, some solution to this uh, dilemma when we come back with uh, our special guest, uh, Joseph G. from Rum Radio. Yeah, and of the course, center of the new universe. The center of the new universe. Right. When we come back. Don't go away. Men, women, and their families experience tremendous pain and suffering due to the struggles they face from substance abuse and its co-occurring mental health challenges. They need to find a safe place for peace and healing. Therapia Addiction Healing Center was born out of a deep desire to provide that safe and powerful healing environment. Therapia exists to help people recover from addictions by developing and maintaining healthy, meaningful relationships with God, self, and others. To speak with an addiction specialist call 1-855-652-4325 that's 1-855-652-4325 or visit our website at www.therapia.net therapia addiction healing center restoring lives one step at a time Chris Schroeder, you are listening to Take12Radio.com, recovery talk and positive music. All right. Uh, welcome back, my friends. Uh, Dr. Alan Berger is on the line with us, along with our special guest uh, during this show, Joseph G. of RumRadio.org. Uh, you can listen to the show live Sundays, 9 p.m. Central. And then there is archives, of course. And at the top of his webpage, over to the right, you will see the live streaming broadcast banner. If you will click on that, uh, you can listen to the shows. All right. Uh, we've been talking about... <clears throat> Uh, stopping allowing other people to edit our reality. Okay, so there's listeners right now, uh, you guys, that, that are saying, yeah, that's easy to say, but how do I do that? Yeah, yeah, so that, that's right. So, and then that's what we want to talk about. You know, the first thing that I say to everybody when they're struggling with this issue is to ask themselves, are you making what somebody else thinks about you more important than what you know. It's that question that I asked that woman when she was struggling with that issue with her son. So this is a really important question for people to ask themselves because when they start to realize that they're making what the other person says more important than what they know, it starts to help them regain their balance, Monty. And see, when I make somebody else more important than, than me, then what I do is I give them all kinds of power to knock me off balance. You know, if we think of 
of our emotions have an emotional center of gravity, right? Right. When that emotional center of gravity is inside of me and over my feet, right, then I'm in a good place, right? Sure. But as soon as I give you that emotional center of gravity or just like with physical center of gravity, as soon as I'm off balance, it's easy to knock me over off my feet. But if I keep my balance, so I weight equally distributed uh, over both of my feet, then my position, you know, then my stance is much more immovable. In fact, in karate, they call it the horse stance, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's the immovable stance because you're you're so grounded. Well, that's what emotional sobriety is. It's helping people learn to get grounded. And one of the things that will help you get grounded is to stop letting other people out of your reality. So when you find yourself doing that, the first thing I say is, what do you know to be true? And can you somehow look at that and compare it to what this other person's limited perception of you is saying is true? Right. So that's that's one way. I think we call this holding on to yourself. Is when you do that kind of work, you're able to hold on to yourself. So um, let, let me just read a little bit from my uh, book, right? So okay. this is from that chapter on, um, it's ca- called Stop Allowing Other People to Edit Your Reality, Smart Thing Number Two. So it says this. It says that holding on to ourselves involves staying centered. We stay centered by balancing our desire to please, to connect and join, with our desire to follow our own directives, to be ourselves. These two basic needs, togetherness and individuality, are constantly operating in our lives. They're like a gravitational force that influences our behavior. When we hold on to our center, we honor both of these needs equally. We connect with the other person, our partner or friends, and allow them to influence us without threatening our individuality. We make a choice to be influenced, um, we honor our individuality at the same time we honor our desire for togetherness. As I noted when explaining the concept of emotional sobriety, Eric Fromm called this union with the preservation of integrity. So hmm. what happens? So if my desire to please you overrides what I know to be true, my individuality, then I'm going to want to adopt your reality of me in order to please you so that you like me. Okay, say that, That's say where that again. That's the problem comes in. You get that money? Say, say, as soon say, as I'm now more concerned with pleasing you and agreeing with your reality of me, then I lose touch with what I know to be true. Yeah. So when I stay balanced, I honor my desire to please you and and I can look at it because one of the things we learn in the program is, you know, we got to practice, uh, you know, or develop a practice of self-examination, step 10. So we're constantly trying to look at ourselves, you know, do I owe somebody amends? Was I wrong here in this situation? So we're open to feedback, but we've got to balance our openness to feedback with our desire to please and with our own desire to hold on to our individuality. When we do that, we stop allowing other people to edit our reality. Sometimes we might say, hey, you know, you're right about that. I was off base the way I said that. Or if somebody says something that wasn't true, you'd say, you know, I've taken a look at that and I just don't see what my part in that is. And uh, I just look at it very differently than you do. And that's okay. And that's and that's okay. We, uh, You know, our differences are okay. The indifferent doesn't mean that we're against the other person. It just means that we're keeping a sense of ourselves. Joseph, any any comments? Well, you know, you could be right. (laughs) (laughs) See, he's a quick study, Monty. We could just have him on as a case example every week. (laughs) He's a quick study, man. You you didn't fry all those cells up there, did you, Joseph? I, 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 I hawked a couple of them, got them back. Um, <laughs> they did, you know, <laughs> thanks for, they're using you to do stem cell research. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to the program, I can stop pretending to be someone else and go back to pretending to be me. 
<laughs> I like that, yeah. And, and, the, and the better you pretend to be yourself, then the more you can hold on to yourself. That's great, man. That's right. Well, you might, you might as well be yourself. Everyone else has been taken. That's true. And, and this is where I love the, the statement, a union with the preservation of integrity. Yeah, isn't that powerful? That is so cool. That's a great bumper yeah. sticker. Yeah, so, you know, that's the thing. So let me leave our listeners with this, and then we'll kind of sign off on this great show that we've had tonight. Um, you know, when I said that Fred Lushkin talked about, you know, these three things that make up a grievance so that he can help people, well, he went the other way to, to unpack them to help people develop forgiveness. So how do you forgive someone? Well, the first thing you do is you stop taking what they did personally. Mm. There you, so go. you have to see that what they did is because of who they are, not because of how they feel about you. And when you do that, you quit taking it personally. The second thing he did is he, he helped people realize that you are responsible for what you feel. It's not somebody else that made you feel this. These are your feelings. And if you own that, then you can start to do something to change them if you want to change them. And then the third thing he did is he said, you know, stop telling yourself, the old story, the narrative that has you a victim and that re-traumatizes you. He says he has people rewrite what happened to them, and this time to have them tell the story from the position of being a survivor or a hero instead of being a victim. That's good. And the way that I tell it to people is I want you to rewrite the story, and I want you to find what you can appreciate from the experience you had and what it's done for you so that you're not just looking at how it's victimized you. Mm. Mm. Good stuff. You know, Good and I've stuff. done that with folks. And it's I'll tell you, Monty, the results are phenomenal in terms of how that helps people work through some of these feelings. So, you know, I encourage all our listeners to get a hold of his book. It's great for Give for Good. And uh, if you want to go along with us in the reading we're doing, Get a hold of 12 Smart Things to Do When the Booze and Drugs Are Gone. The 12 Smart Things to Do When the Booze and Drugs Are Gone by Dr. Alan Berger. And uh, they can go uh, at uh, abphd.com and get that book. They, you can also go to uh, to Hazelden's website and get that book. and they get it on Amazon? Yep, Amazon's probably uh, Amazon and Hazelton are good sources. I send them out to you, too. Uh, but uh, I think you'll get them quicker if you go to <laughs> Hazel Dinner or Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. I'm, I'm losing my voice. I don't know why I, I didn't talk that much uh, today, but um, it, it's, it, God probably wants me to shut up because he, because I know I'm right. Right, Dr. Berger? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Hey, and listen, and just a big kudo to you, uh, Joseph, and all the great work you're doing on Rum Radio. Thank you, Alan. That's uh, that's important coming from you. Thank you. Yeah, jo Joseph, uh, you, you do do a, a, an awful lot there. And, um, y you know, I as a broadcaster and, and Dr. Berger and what he does and what you do, we all know how much work goes into that. The listeners don't always know. But believe me, listeners, there is a lot of passion. There is a lot of dedication and uh, there's a lot of serious, serious work uh, that, that these two guys do. And I would just encourage you to visit Dr. Berger's website. Uh, visit Rum Radio at rumradio.org. Uh, check out the shows. And I, I, I got to tell you, there's always something uh, new to be learned or something old to be refreshed. Uh, there really is. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Joseph, so much, buddy. You're welcome, Monty. Anytime. Thank you. Okay, don't hang up. You, don't hang up, you guys. Thank you, Doctor Berger. All right, take care. All right, uh, folks. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man, along with Doctor Alan Berger and Joseph G from Rum Radio, and we're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye bye. Bye. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting.